Good morning, and uh, thank you so much for the privilege of being here to describe a process we've learned that helps communities end and prevent homelessness, not by spending more money or adding specialty programs, but by learning to work together differently, by working collaboratively. And I have to say, it is very special for me to be here because um, over 100 years ago, as Joe mentioned, uh, my ancestors, my great-grandparents, left Donegal for America. And like so many Irish throughout history who were uprooted from their homes by dire economic circumstances, my great-grandparents had to rely on the help of strangers to establish a new life in the Boston area. And uh, as we Irish know better than most, the experience of homelessness through our family stories, we know that generations of us have survived because of networks of other Irish who helped us find jobs and places to live and extended friendship uh, at times we were seeking new homes. So I think it's a very interesting and important backdrop to describing this process that we've come upon because that process that um, so many of our family experienced of relying on mutual aid and of collaborative community supports um, I think the time has come to revive that because while um, so many good organizations and well-intentioned government bodies have come to take the place of that mutual aid and collective community responsibility, uh, we've gone in the direction, and Madeline described this, of specialized services. And we now have specialty programs for emergency accommodation, for housing support, for training, for job placement, for the range of things that a person or family in crisis would need. And again, these are all good things, these services, the intentions behind them are wonderful and the care with which this work is done is often exemplary. Yet there's a problem because individuals and families in crisis often need more than one thing. And they need more than just housing or just a job to put their lives back on track after a crisis. They often need housing, a job, help with health issues, help with their children, help with school, help with addictions. And yet our services are not designed to work collaboratively. And so we find ourselves in a place where services are designed for single problems, while the most vulnerable among us, those that I'm describing who are in transition, who have uh, challenges on many fronts, they have complex problems that require multidimensional solutions. And so in speaking today about what ends and prevents homelessness, I actually could be speaking about any complex human situation where those in trouble require more than one thing. And thus, I hope you take two messages away from my remarks. One, that Ireland can end homelessness. And two, that complex multi-layered problems require multidimensional collaborative solutions and that effective structures are emerging to enable this collaborative problem solving. And I'm going to be intensely practical in my remarks because I really believe we have no time to waste in theorizing on these issues. People's lives are literally at stake. And so I'm going to share our experience of changing the way we work, we organizationally and we as a growing group of people in this field in the United States to become more effective by becoming more collaborative. And I'm going to illustrate the learning process um, that we've gone through um, organizationally ourselves because this journey to transform our way of working can be painful. Um, it involves us giving up treasured notions about our organizational identities sometimes, uh, gives, a, uh, gives us pause about moving out of our comfort zone and our ways of working traditionally. Uh, but the payoff is frankly doing better work that makes a greater impact in the lives of people who need our help. Um, and to set the stage, in the United States at any given moment we have 650,000 people who are homeless. That includes members of families. Uh, and over the course of a year it's from one and a half million to two million people. But importantly, what we've learned by really becoming uh, ferociously focused on data is that about 127,000 of that larger number are individuals who remain trapped in homelessness uh, for years. 
uh, thank God, the, uh, the most frequent experience of homelessness is about 30 days. For most, it's an emergency condition that can, uh, typical supports and help in the community can help to resolve. But there is that group, and there, it's the group with the most serious and complex challenges who need not just a home, but mental health care or help with addictions or help with health issues. That's the group that sort of sinks to the bottom and that we have failed consistently in the United States and sadly in most developed uh, nations to really pay close attention to. And so our work has evolved to really be about rallying the nation to end chronic homelessness, to focus on the hardest to serve, those who've been in this uh, downward spiral the longest, and in fact, who are, in addition to being the most vulnerable to actually dying on the streets of our country, are actually costing the most to public institutions. These are individuals, as they remain homeless, who are in and out of hospitals, in and out of jails, in and out of drug treatment. And so we are faced with the irrefutable evidence that doing the right thing morally and humanly is actually doing the smart thing economically. Uh, for us, organizationally, I'll just give you our backstory. I started one not-for-profit common ground back in 1990 to build housing for the homeless, and we built about 3,000 apartments in and around New York City. But we uh, stepped back at a certain moment once we had built about uh, 1,500 units of housing in Manhattan and realized something deeply uncomfortable. That is, uh, wonderful as the buildings were and they were successful and people were not returning to homelessness and they were restoring landmark properties that made the neighbors happy and added value to the community property owners. Uh, uh, we were still passing the same people that we had seen living on the streets in Manhattan before we opened our first apartment. So we had been diligent in seeking applications from shelters and other emergency accommodations in and around New York City. But uh, we had not actually reached the people who had in many ways inspired us to do this work with people who were living on the street. And so despite our having you know, a profound impact on many people's lives, we had not made a dent in the urgent problem that was literally looking us in the face every day. And so for a while, we blamed the homeless for not being willing to move off the street and into our buildings. Um, we were in fact told by street outreach workers that were employed by other NGOs that those on the street were, um, the term they used was service resistant. Uh, well, finally, we actually asked the people on the street themselves why they were there and not making their way into our housing. And what we learned actually stunned us uh, in, in, in the best, uh, most humbling way. We learned that they had never been offered the chance. All of these outreach workers funded, you know, good organizations funded by many millions of government dollars over many years were trained to connect the homeless on the street with emergency accommodation, not to offer them help in finding a home. Every single one of those individuals had had some kind of frightening experience at a shelter in New York City and didn't want to go back there. But because they were outside the official system and not following the rules, they were just literally left to die on the street. Uh, they weren't even acknowledged to be homeless because they didn't have an official homeless number. And yet they were the people we saw and passed every day. So we, um, we learned a hard lesson there, that um, even if um, uh, uh, help in finding a home was everyone's intention, that our own regulations and other kind of crazy organizational barriers often stood in the way of life-saving processes. Um, and, and frankly, even if we got through those rules and the processes, we realized that it required almost a year of effort to move a single person off the street, if it could be accomplished at all. So because these individuals were frankly known to everyone, you know, the cops in the neighborhood, the business people, we all knew them, um, we concluded that um, any kind of work that we needed to do to change this reality ought to draw on the information that all of our neighbors had, as well as our own expertise. And we looked at the, as a first step, 
our own barriers as an organization running housing. And one that we had created that was absolutely arbitrary, we realized, was that we required a six-month period of sobriety before someone could move into our building. And so what that meant is that many of the people who needed our help the most could not meet that criteria and were therefore blocked from services. It was the beginning of a series of confrontations with uncomfortable truths about the way we were working and that even as we moved toward collaboration and in examining the rules that governed our businesses, that um, the, the weight of all of these kind of silos, rules, and, and practices that had gone unexamined uh, had made all of us in the helping field a big part of the problem. And so we came to this moment of realizing we had a choice to make, that we could keep doing good work. I mean, all the while we were housing people who had been homeless and you know it was a wonderful environment for them and connecting them with health and mental health and employment support. We could keep going that way, or we could follow the, the line of this new series of discoveries about those that we were leaving out. And what we decided to do, and it was not an easy decision because it really required making quite a leap, is that um, a, a whole group of us left the organization we'd founded to start a new organization, Community Solutions, really to explore what would be required to work differently and to really make, uh, as Madeline said, you know, our customer, the person who was not getting service and who was living on the street. And so, at the heart of this effort in our new organization was um, learning to create and manage multi-stakeholder collaboratives to actually tear down the bureaucratic barriers and to question the really oppressive and, um, and, and contradictory rules that got in the way of our assisting people and also to take what we were learning and intentionally from day one to spread this set of practices we were creating and to use the theory of uh, around the diffusion of innovation that um, actually uh, looks at a change process of, uh, of any type in any system of involving at least five different sets of actors. Innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. And I'm gonna describe each of these terms and illustrate it as I talk about our process for both learning how to work collaboratively and actually spreading this learning as we ourselves were experiencing it back in New York City. So what we, what we discovered first when we committed ourselves to breaking through these barriers that were keeping people from moving off the street was that we had to um, first organize a team of um, actors which include ha included housing providers, the city of New York that controlled many of the resources. Uh, we needed uh, people working in the mental health field we needed to organize the churches locally to actually support us in helping bring people to appointments and waiting to you know, get people uh, through these complicated bureaucracies. So we, we had this kind of huge team guided by, um, interestingly, a, a, a person I hired who was completely outside our sector. Um, uh, I, I, I thought for a bit about hiring a very experienced social worker who'd been working for years with the homeless and realized that might actually not get us the radical change we needed. So I ended up hiring um, a military intelligence officer <laughs> who uh, came right in uh, with a whole set of skills around mapping the ground truth, what's actually happen happening here. And uh, under her leadership and the team that we formed around her, we realized that step one would always be organizing the multi-stakeholder team clarifying the, the goal um, and actually knowing person by person who we needed to focus on and also uh, knowing what the community resources were, really taking a new approach to inventorying resources, not looking at maybe the narrow bucket of housing for the homeless that existed and was funded in New York City, but stepping back and saying, we're surrounded by housing. Why can't we get some of that and that and that? And also, who are the other people in the community who would have a stake, a natural stake in finding good solutions? Hospitals who were spending a fortune and had people in and out of emergency rooms. The police who didn't want to be arresting people who, whose only crime was being homeless. We got all of these people who had nowhere to go with their frustrations about the way they were working to actually join our team. And we also realized that we had to make really dignified, respectful offers of housing 
that each one of these individuals needed to be able to exercise some personal choice in the decision. And so we had to be responsive to not just, here's what we got for you, but what would make you feel at home? And then we had to put systems in place that would allow people to succeed in their homes once they were there, to connect them to their new neighborhood, to the places they lived, and to the services they would need. So we, um, in a, a sort of rapid order, it was, um, it, it, it seemed to have gone by in a flash, although it was a, a bit of a slow start. Within two years, we had, in the 20 blocks of Midtown Manhattan, um, found that while there were about 55 people who were on the street consistently, only 18 of them were there every single day. And we learned that by going out early in the morning, not you know, nine to five hours, really hard to tell who's homeless there. Uh, we started going out from 4 to 6 a.m. and realized that there was this very distinct pattern of a small uh, cohort of individuals, about 18, who were there all the time, and just instinctively started working with those individuals who'd been homeless on average over 10 years. And as we got the first group into housing, something quite amazing happened. It was as though homelessness itself just vanished. It took two years, but we went from 55 people living on the streets regularly to seven. And uh, it was as people moved into housing, that, that group of 18, it's as though some kind of environmental signal was sent, which is actually, you know, maybe we should not be homeless here. You know, maybe we should be getting, uh, using the city's emergency services. And it wasn't just that 20 block area where we saw an 87% reduction in two years. We saw a 43% reduction in all of Midtown Manhattan by organizing the resources and really changing the mindset that it's not about handing out sandwiches anymore. It's about getting vulnerable people into housing. Uh, it took a couple of years, but the city of New York then recontracted all those outreach services and really changed what it meant to do outreach to the homeless to be about getting people into housing. And so that process, as we were doing it, we were reaching out to other people in other cities who were, um, uh, we knew to be um, innovators and doing good work there and helping people make the transition from the streets to home. And we uh, had this informal learning group of about uh, 19 cities. Uh, like we were doing our thing in New York. We were learning things from Denver and from Atlanta and from uh, Minnesota, a few cities there. And what we realized after a few years of, of all of us seeing success was that we were really onto something and that this collabor set of collaborations that we were forming locally and this collaboration we were forming across cities nationally actually offered something very, very um, kind of revolutionary, not just for our cause of homelessness, but as a new way of working in our, in our sector. And so we um, decided we would take on, as a community, these, uh, th this, this core group of, of, um, of, of vanguard cities, the whole question of why in a wealthy, powerful country like the United States do we allow 127,000 people to remain homeless for years? And so we um, initiated something two years ago in July called the 100,000 Homes Campaign. And our goal is nothing short of changing the way we approach homelessness in the United States and ending this uh, scandal of long-term homelessness. And so we've gone about it by first targeting the 55 cities that account for over 65% of homelessness in the United States. And what we, within that, have done is to um, uh, really break down the process uh, by this diffusion of innovation uh, concept and to very relentlessly uh, uh, identify in each city, you know, who are, are the ones we can count on as the innovators and who else do we need to bring along using a different strategy. And so I'll tell you how the process works on the ground. Um, it begins with a registry week. We train cities together, cohorts of cities together. And uh, to date, 70 cities now have completed a registry week, which involves mobilizing community volunteers, um, well over 100 in most communities, to canvas the streets of their community over the course of three days, from 4 to 6 a.m., to create a public health registry, a by-name prioritized list of everyone who's homeless. Uh, it's prioritized based on health vulnerabilities, and we use public health tools to actually query people about uh, whether they have one of eight health conditions that correlates to early mortality. We call this the vulnerability index. And now, nationally, over 35,000 homeless people have been surveyed, and there's a remarkable consistency from city to city about the health conditions of the homeless and, 
age. It's really quite shocking what we're learning and how this data resource that uh, my organization manages for the country has really given a whole new picture to the country of what we're looking at. And we're looking at an urgent public health crisis, not a criminal justice or a nuisance problem. And uh, we, we've realized, based on just these 35,000 um, surveys alone, that there's a higher mortality rate for the homeless than there is for cancer victims. And so we're, we're beginning to change attitudes about really what the nature of the problem is. And to just illustrate using one city, for instance, in San Diego, uh, California, that began um, uh, their process uh, about two years ago, they had 270 volunteers come out from not-for-profits, the business community, the faith groups. Everyone had a role. And so what we have done is, after identifying the early uh, or the, the innovators, we have looked for uh, the groups that we'll call the early adopters. Uh, the groups that uh, maybe they don't start with having the great ideas themselves, but they're the ones who are willing to give something a try. And they need help in creating the conditions that unleash their kind of creativity and their willingness to act. And so our primary objective throughout the campaign, uh, and, and our goal is to have 100,000 of these 127,000 people housed by July 2014. And we use the early adapter community, adopter communities to really be the ones to demonstrate the evidence, working with innovators about what techniques really get the job done. And so as we get results, and we've, we've created all sorts of um, collaborative training opportunities to help people improve their process, to help them uh, take, once they've identified those who've been homeless the longest, to take the process down from sometimes a year in their cities to a gold standard objective of 30 days of getting people into housing in 30 days. Now we've seen thus far communities go from like 260 days to 40 days. Uh, we haven't gotten to 30 days in any but one city yet, but we know it's possible. But, but what we also do then is take that evidence and show it to other cities who are curious in order to get them to try it out. That's the early majority group. Uh, thus far, we're now up to 146 cities in the United States, plus five in Australia and two in Canada. And what we've been able to accomplish thus far with the early majority group, and we haven't even touched the group that needs the rules rewritten for them, which we'll call the late majority, uh, but uh, what we've been able to accomplish is over 19,000 people housed in the last two years from a standing start. And we are on track mathematically to get to this 100,000 100, persons housed goal. And uh, one of the things that we've learned to do is to also be very strategic about what we'll call the laggards, the group that just will sit there and complain and think of reasons not to change. We spend a lot of time with these folks early on and have made the decision to ignore them and uh, to just keep going and to show that uh, these results uh, can change lives, can save communities money, and can actually show new ways of bringing together landlords, churches, government, uh, uh, mental health providers, uh, providers of all kinds of social services to actually be more effective and reach those for whom until recently we thought there was no hope. So um, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm going to not be able to show you a wonderful uh, little video. Um, maybe you can find it off by the side today. But there's nothing like the power of showing picture from community after community throughout the United States now of people who are living on the streets and now in their new homes. And the physical uh, transformation that is so evident when you see that uh, not just uh, change in these individuals' lives as possible, but change in our own attitudes. Thank you.